Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. When I was with the circus, it was a three-ring show. An act either took place in all three rings, like the elephant act, or the act performed in one ring only, like the lion and tiger act. Our guest today, Dr. Lydia Evans, works in a universe of three, which you will hear about in this episode. It's interesting. Lydia is a child of divorce, kind of. You'll also hear an explanation for that. Has been married and divorced twice and is about to marry, unless you changed your mind, Lydia, since we last talked, for the third time. Lydia has wisdom to bring to this discussion about amicable divorces, what she's learned, and how she makes decisions going forward. So just a tad of the background, Lydia is CEO and founder of Pure Momentum Consulting. She also is author of Organizational Poverty, Valuing Human Capital in Nonprofit Settings. I I, I like that, Lydia, by the way. I wanted to say that. And she's also credentialed as a certified business coach and certified employee performance coach, empowering others and facilitating sustainable change for individuals and organizations. I mean, this is all really great stuff, especially in the world of businesses are changing. Where we work, how we work, how we interface, such an amazing change. And and you're right at the forefront of all of that. Um, She got her her BA in English and psychology, so I love that as part of what you do uh, for a living and then how this is going to influence how we discuss um, your experience with divorce going forward. She also got an MA in education, instructional leadership, and her doctorate of education in organizational leadership. Thank you for joining us, Lydia. I really appreciate it. Judith, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat. Okay, so the audience is going to love really everything, but let's go to the first part that they're going (laughs) to love. So Lydia, you had parents, (laughs) two of them, and then you only had one of them. You said Mm -hmm. at age three, your dad left, but would you explain what's unique about your parents' situation going forward when he left and you were three years old? Yeah. um, So uh, what was interesting is that my mother uh, still feels as though and still would celebrate and and, um, speak to the marriage um, anniversary date uh, that that she that she had with my father since she technically never divorced, even though they separated and my my dad went on to other relationships and to, they live completely separate lives when I turned three, um, they never technically divorced. And so my mom um, still honors that as a, as a marriage. So, uh, and, and my father passed away when I was 16, uh, but um, my mom will still talk about, uh, you know, when the, when that, when the wedding anniversary date comes up, she'll still reference it. Did she celebrate it or did she celebrate it in her own way? I think there was at least um, an acknowledgement, a deep acknowledgement. I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say that there was a celebration, but there was a, a deep acknowledgement of it uh, when it came, when it comes around every year, uh, and and still to this day. And why? Um, because my, my my parents were Christian and are Christian, um, and so the, the, the idea of, of marriage and the sanctity of marriage and, and the importance of that uh, holds strong, which is why even though um, there was separation, obviously, uh, that's, why there, I, that's why I believe there was never a divorce, an official legal divorce, because, um, because of the stance of how that may feel or look uh, from the Christian perspective. So obviously your dad was of like mind to with your mom, right? Because even though he had other relationships, he never really pushed her to get divorced. That's right. That's right. Okay. So what state did you grow up in? Missouri, in St. Louis, in the Midwest. Okay. 
Um, when I have dealt with Christians that within their religious philosophy, divorce is really not recognized. Now, I grew up Roman Catholic. I don't exactly live like that, but I grew up Roman Catholic. And in the dark ages when I was younger, uh, there was no divorce. You could not be Catholic if you got divorced. And that has since softened. But within your particular brand of Christianity, however you grew up, did they not recognize what we call in California a legal separation? Was that ever discussed as you got older? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't. Think, I don't think it was a legal separation. I know, obviously, my dad moved out, uh, but I don't think that there was. They went through the process of the legal filing for a legal separation um, in in that particular way. I, I think that that in and of itself may have felt a little bit too close to divorce or maybe walking the path towards divorce. Um, So I don't think that that ever happened. Well, okay. So in California, we have two, two categories to file in. Well, actually three. We have divorce, legal separation, and annulment. And Mm -hmm. annulment is based on fraud. I've never done an annulment. I don't want to touch something like that because to prove fraud is beyond beyond my license area. I'm I'm not okay. an attorney, so it's beyond my license area. <clears throat> but of the of the very serious Christians that have come to this office that really do want to adhere to the principles of their religion, they have found that filing for a legal separation, which is a category, a a status category, as opposed to, well, we're just not living together, so we are separated. Does that mean we're legally separated? No, there's nothing legal about it. You have just chosen not to live together, but you are still actually creating community property if you're still married, regardless of how far away you live from one another. That's right. So, One of the options, I'm just saying this to listeners who may also belong to a religion that does not approve of divorce, I am finding that as the years go on, legal separation is approved. So you're not living together, you're not creating community property, but you cannot remarry because you're actually not divorced. Okay. And that's, that seems to be the middle way. So that's why I really wanted to talk about this and, and have the listeners um, enjoy your experience. And so now further with that, you as a child, did you have contact with your dad? How close was he geographically? Oh, um, he wasn't that far. He was probably about 30 minutes away. Um, uh, geographically and, and yes he he definitely he came by he he I saw him I think mostly in relationship to school events uh and like parent teachers conferences and he would take me like places like the zoo and um science center and and, and things like that so yeah okay that's good that's really sweet yeah. and did you find that your parents were amicable towards each other or just didn't say anything did they kind of just um allow you to love each of them equally without worrying about loving them? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I feel like uh, what I can say is that I, I don't necessarily know that their their relationship with each other was was all that great. Um, I, I think it was very, I think strained would probably be the best word to describe it. So as far as like when they would actually interact in front of me, like together. Uh, but what I will definitely say is that neither my father or my mother said anything negative about the other person to me. Uh, so that enabled me, I think, to be able to build my own relationship with my mother and my father. My mother never said any, even though things happened that she didn't agree with or approve of. She never said anything negative about him as a person. Um, and so uh, I, I think that that was, that was really, really big uh, for me to be able to build my own relationship with them. And I think that they handled that in a very mature way, even though, even though the relationship between them was very, very strained and very difficult. You know, that's huge. That really, really is huge. And 
I, I hope they feel good that they did that because, you know, it's so easy for me as a mediator or, you know, a, a person filing to say if there's minor children, the best thing you can do for your children is be respectful to each other. Because with all of the concerns the kids have about living in two households, you know, I don't know that you went back and forth, but, you know, with a traditional co-parenting plan, X amount of days at one parent's house, X amount of days at another parent's house, with all that in mind, and kids worry about, am I going to forget my homework? Am I still going to have my friends? Will I have to go to a new school? I mean, all those normal things that they do worry about at the end of the day. That's nothing compared to if their parents just get along, that's everything to their world. And it really sounds like without probably even major discussion, that organically happened for you and that you're really lucky. It, it, it really did. Um, and I think I didn't realize how, how uh, difficult that can be and how intentional I think that the, the two parents have to be in that regards until... Uh, I became older and ended up in a blended relationship and things like that myself. But yeah, that, that, that was really big. So that happened in your first marriage, did you tell me? Yes, the first marriage, yes. I, we, we, we had a blended family. Okay, so 23 years old, you got married and you had a blended family. How many children were involved and what was that experience as a stepmother like? It was just one child, uh, a daughter, um, and it, it was a challenge because I'm actually an only child. So, so as an only child, um, I think you lose a little bit of the, the the social development that you have naturally when you have built-in siblings. So, so, so to be to 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 go from you know kind of being on your own or being by yourself to now being in a relationship now you have the social aspect of that and then now to being a parent or step parent is uh, is is a whole different level of social skills that are kind of required there so um, it was definitely a learning experience uh, for me for sure for sure and and I could see the challenges in um, and it was that we all had to navigate these challenges like just like you were talking about she had to navigate them between the two households um, and between living with us and and staying with her mother and then her mom ended up getting uh, remarried so staying with her mother and her stepfather on that side the rules of the house the houses being quite different uh, between the two and having to adjust back and forth every time she came here or when back there. Um, and then the amount of communication that was needed between all four of the parents um, for us to be able to try to do our best with, with supporting her. So it was quite extensive. Well, okay. First, first with that, you were an only child. She's an only child. Was that helpful in terms of you understanding her? I would say so. I would say so. Um, it explained a lot about, I think, why she uh, was so um, attached to us as adults and also spoke very maturely and acted very maturely. And it was because there weren't any other kids around, right? And so I, I, I could bring your maturity that. down. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I could relate to that because I thought I was grown because I only saw grown people. So <laughs> it made total sense. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, when you end up, ended up getting divorced and it was how many years? Uh, seven years. Okay. So it was seven years. And when you ended up getting divorced, how do you think that affected her? Because now she's gone through two divorces, right? Yeah, uh, well, she technically she went through one uh, the, the, because uh, her and her and her father, uh, her her mother and her father weren't married uh, initially. So so she had one divorce, but the, but multiple separations, right? Uh, right. Okay. Her experience. Absolutely. Um, and so um, I'm not quite sure uh, how she actually felt. Uh, only because I never heard from them again. So we divorced and we signed uh, the, the, the papers and that was it. So I never heard from my ex-husband again or his family again or her again. Um, I'm sure that, that it was a challenge 
just because she had already had so much transition uh, and change happening in her life, so much uh, to date at, at such a young age. Uh, so I think on some level, it may have almost been expected, maybe, from her. It may, it may have felt like it was just something that, you know, because it keeps happening, um, that it may right. have felt like it, it was a normal process. I, I hope and pray that, that she doesn't, she hasn't grown up to think that this is just how things are supposed to be. Uh, but, um, but that's kind of my, my, my gut feeling of how I think it may, I think it may have affected her uh, less because it just happened. It's happened. It, had, it had already happened. Well, how did you say goodbye to her? What were your yeah parting words or last time you saw her? Wow, um, I couldn't even tell you. I couldn't tell you because really my conversations weren't with her; they were with her father. Um, so I don't necessarily think. Um, and now thinking back, I probably should have done that much differently. But I don't think that I had like a formal. Um, intentional sit down conversation to say I, I, what I, what did happen is that him and I together we had a conversation with her saying that we were no longer going to be together and you know they were going to be moving out and you know these kind of things like that that took place but I don't I don't remember having a one on one okay. uh, yeah conversation with her uh, to kind of make that that transition and I think part of that was because um, Blended families are tough, and really, at the end of the day, uh, it's 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 hard to 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 massage that that uh, invisible but very functional line between the the parent and the and the and their child and you as a step parent. Um, and so, I think that I, I in my mind, thinking about it in retrospect, I think in my mind I wanted to leave a lot of that to him because. Because A, he was the person who's going to be the stable in her life and the constant in her life. Um, and, and B, um, he would be able to deal with it post me being gone versus me trying to uh, address it and I'm not any longer going to be in her life. So, um, but those are huge things to think about in relationship to, to, to a blended family and a divorce. Without a doubt, without a doubt, I really do wonder how kids take it if they're uh, involved in two or more uh, change of parents. Do you remember how she reacted when you both sat down and told her? Or is this too long ago? <laughs> no, this is a while ago. Um, I know that she was, I, I think that, that, that she was definitely sad. I don't think that she cried. I don't remember that, but I, but I know that she was definitely sad. The, the, the transition coming in was difficult uh, of me, me, me being added to the family. And I think that over time, um, we had developed a relationship and we had developed a bond. And so now we're talking about me transitioning out uh, of of the family structure, um, and so I think that 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 yeah, I think it was I think it was definitely difficult for her. Um, but she was also about maybe twelve, eleven, something like that. So I was going to ask how old. So it, yeah, she was the age young. of the child does make a little bit of a difference, and right. you know maybe at that age she had other friends who had similar situations and you know i don't know whether whether this is a fair overall statement to make um but i have found in a lot of cases not being married and separating is tougher than being married and separating and and and, and this is just me putting my own impression on it I, it almost seems to me that when you're married, there's at least a structure around the two people, a container, so to speak. And it's a little more organized how you move forward. When there's no marriage, it's what we call a paternity situation. You are connected by your child and that's it. And that it's not, it doesn't feel or look like as formal an organization, a system 
for the parents to work within. Do, is that making any sense to you with your experience? It, it makes complete sense, which is why um, the, 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 the integration, either one of those transitions, either coming in or, or coming out or even being within uh, a structure that is, is unformalized is really, really difficult because it's like there, there are no, there are no absolutes um, they're, they're, and everything is kind of being developed along the way or not being developed based upon each person's individual's opinion of what they think should be happening at the time. Um, and so it's really tough to kind of, uh, to, to bring all of those pieces together uh, to try to create uh, that, that structure, as it were, when, when there's no legal reason to have that structure. Right. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, what was the divorce like? Not what was the marriage like. What was the divorce like? Was it amicable? Was it participatory? What was it like? Um, it was definitely very amicable and participatory. Um, we didn't have any shared things that needed to be kind of dis- disillusioned or separated or anything like that. So it was very straightforward divorce. Um and, uh, you know, we had before before we had gotten to the point of divorce, we had already had a, a, a separation midway through the seven years. Um, and so that, you know, by the time we got to the divorce side of it, I think it was pretty much understood between the both of us that it just wasn't working out as husband and wife. Uh, we will probably be better as friends. Uh, but definitely not working out the way that we were wanting it to as husband and wife. So it, it wasn't a situation where he was surprised when I came to him and said, I think we need to make this move. Um, and, uh, and he was very, uh, um, uh, I guess, what would I say the word would be? Uh, I don't want to say supportive. I mean, he, he wasn't happy with the, with the decision, uh, but he didn't do anything to uh, make it any more difficult than it needed to be. And so he he followed through on his end with the pieces and the paperwork and everything. Um, and we were able to do that. And then, uh, yeah, and then that was it. Like, <laughs> So may I ask, Lydia, Yeah, was it around three years into this relationship that there was a shift? Well, Judith, you know, it was about <laughs> three years. Of course it was. So three and a half years, we, we had our separation. I think we were separated for about eight months or so. And then we got back together for the last three and a half years kind of, of the relationship. That's funny. That, <laughs> that, that is, you can only take people in three-year doses. <laughs> it's already been uh, <laughs> laid down from when you were a kid. Okay, so cool. So it was, it, it was amicable. I always love hearing this. I really do. Absolutely. Now let's go to the second marriage. So how many years after the first marriage did you get married again? You dated three, wait a minute, I'm looking at my notes. You dated three and a half years before you got married. See, here's where the three comes in, everybody. This is fascinating. <laughs> so when you hear about the third relationship she's in, that number three is going to come back again. Okay. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so three and a half years you dated, then you got married. But what was different about this marriage, this relationship? Um, it probably the biggest difference would have been the age difference. Um, so... I think that that played out uh, over time um, in, in the relationship. So that's probably the biggest difference between the two. And the age difference was? And the age difference was, if I was to do math, I think it was 38 years. So he, was, he, is, he is 38 years my senior. How old were you when you got married to, to this gentleman? 35? Okay, yeah. you were in your 30s. You were in your 30s. And, mm-hmm. and he was 38. Interesting because, well, I live in Hollywood, so there are major age differences to second and third marriages. There really are. I'm used to that, but we also have this one marriage. Wait, we have more than one marriage. So on the Beverly Hills Housewives, which is the reality show that I reference a lot and that I watch a lot, we have the the marriage of the, of the city, of the state, of the country, Erica Jane and Tom Girardi. He's 33 years her senior. 
They met when she was in her early 20s. He was a very successful personal injury attorney. She did not grow up with a father. Her mother was, I think her, she said her mother made her grow up faster than normal. So she matured quickly, uh, left Georgia, grew up in Georgia, and then in her early 20s moved to Los Angeles. She wanted to be a performer, so it made sense. And she actually did go on to perform some years ago and still does. She met Tom at uh, a world-famous restaurant in Beverly Hills called Chasen's. It's no longer here anymore. There's a Bristol Farms in its place. But I was lucky enough to go to Chasen's and do events there when I moved to Los Angeles. On this particular show, though, I think there are two other relationships that are at least 20 years apart, if not between 20 and 30-something. Very interesting. What was it like being with somebody 38 years your senior? So that was a blended family, but in a different way. So, so, the, so the, the, the first blended family was a young child. The second blended family was all the children were older than I was. So all oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's a whole different wrinkle, right? It's to have to deal with. Wrinkle. All of his children were older than me. How many have children did he have? Um, six. Oh, my. Six children, but uh, 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 one of them was actually deceased uh, at the time that we got together. But um, yeah. five is enough. Five is a lot, you know, in this day and age. Well, what what was the fallback, the blowback? How tough was it for you to connect with them? Um, it was it was definitely it was it was easier, I think, for the for the the, the boys. Um, the men, um, uh, his sons, much more, I think, difficult to connect with uh, his two daughters. Um, and I think that there was a lot of just, I think, as it's common in a situation where you have um, a, a, a older man that's more established, maybe owns some property, has some money or has some business. It's very common, I think, to feel like the the young woman is trying to take him for everything that he has or uh, has other intentions other than good intentions for wanting to be with someone that is that much older uh, than, than she is. So, um, so that I, I think that I, I, I was fighting that narrative for the majority of the time that we were, that we were together. And it's a very common narrative. I just didn't realize how difficult that that could be. Uh, playing out in 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 real life, and and then him and I, of course, we had our our challenges too. Because when we we were completely in completely two different, many different diff- generations apart as far as decision making and goals and 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 um, just everything. So so there was a lot to that. There is, you know, I think of the difficulty. In just something like, well, what do we call you? Obviously, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a risk and say they didn't call you mom. Oh. They called you by your first name, doctor. No, <laughs> they called you Lydia. Right. Dr. <laughs> Evans to them, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. And how about you? What was it like for you in that experience dealing with stepchildren that were older than you? What, what, okay, what was the closest in age that you were to any of the five? Um, I was definitely closest in age to the, his youngest son, but I don't think that we actually ever met, which was interesting. Um, but um, yeah, and, and I think it could be that either I may be a year or two older than him or he or somewhere somewhere in there, but that was the closest. Um, and then there was, you know, kind of going up, there was probably... Um, probably about a 20 or 15 or 20 year difference from myself and the oldest. Yeah. His oldest child. Um, so what was it like for you though, dealing with them? It was, it, it was different. <laughs> it was definitely different. Um, I, I think when you're dealing with a younger child in a blended family, um, you're, you're very much the caretaker of, of, of the child. So it's a much different perspective and you're worried about, are they getting picked up from school and everything else when you're dealing with a uh, step, children in quotation that are older than you, I think you spend a lot more of your time trying to prove yourself um, ah. 
as to why you deserve to be in this family or why you deserve to be respected or, uh, or, 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 or the, the benefit of what you can bring, right, uh, to, to the family structure or to, the, to those dynamics. Um, and so I, I felt like I did a lot more trying to get people to like me in the second marriage by far than I did in the, in the first one. Completely understandable. Was he supportive of you when introducing you to his kids and dealing with whatever the issues were, you know, whatever they may have shared with him? Was he supportive of you or did you kind of feel you were fighting that a little bit too? Did he feel pulled? And another way to ask the question is, did he feel pulled between his children and you? I think that's a much more accurate assessment um, of of it is, is that I don't think that he ever quite got the, the footing, his footing of, of being able to kind of see where he was and how, how he was able to establish the balance between, um, both his myself, his children, and then also his, his some of his other demands and responsibilities that he had in his life, uh, other family obligations, um, things like that. And I think that he was constantly was feeling in this sense of being torn in two or three different directions. Um, and and I think that that was for me. It was like I felt like I wasn't getting enough. Uh, attention or time or, or 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 things like that while he was also dealing with all of these other uh, uh, dynamics that had existed before I was born, you know, yes. <laughs> that, that he was dealing with. Um, so I think that that was definitely it. And I, I think that he, he, I think that he really struggled with that. Um, and, and because I was, I think from an objective perspective, I can see that and understand that, but because I was one of the 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 pools or one of the the areas that needed attention and support and development, um, it became kind of like un- untenable <laughs> for me. But but definitely in retrospect and definitely looking at it from the outside, yeah, he was pulled in a lot of different directions, a lot of different expectations, uh, a lot of conflicting expectations uh, and 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 responsibilities. Um, and, and just time, I think all of those things combined to, to make it really difficult for him. Was this his second marriage as well? This was his third marriage. Okay, this was his third marriage. And Lydia, how long were you married? So we were married for two and a half years, right up on that, close to that three month, three year thing. Hmm, I have three years written in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, give or take, well, give or take. <laughs> <laughs> I just found that so fascinating that your parents separated when you were three. Um, three years or so into the first marriage, you separated, then came back for another three or so. And in this marriage, three. I, I just find that interesting. A couple other things you were telling me, and I, I wanted you to address these. There was a prenup, but you advanced that conversation. That's right. That's right. And that was that was once again kind of my intent of trying to push back against the narrative that I was trying to join the family or marry him because I was trying to get him for everything that he had. Uh, so I did, uh, you know, initiate and and say that I wanted to have a prenup, and we did go and get that that done. Yeah. Did that make any difference with the children? Did they feel Absolutely better? not. <laughs> Dang. Nothing Absolutely. satisfies these kids. Nothing, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> and I'm just looking at my notes because we had such a great conversation. I took notes before. Um, any, any issues of high-conflict communication? What, what drove the marriage to end? Um, I think that we did have, you know, a fair amount of maybe fights or disagreements. Um, but I think it was more just that we, there was not enough time and space because of all the, the, all the conflicting needs and, and responsibilities. There wasn't enough space to actually, uh, create a foundation for our relationship. 
So just like what we were talking about earlier, where there's a there's not a structure because there is no marriage. In this case, there was a legal structure because there was a marriage, but there was not time put into building the foundation of that house. So there was no house, as it were. Actually, we didn't even live in the same house, actually. We lived in two separate places. Um, And so even trying to just figure that out was, you know, becoming difficult. So there was, was, I think, too much separation. Um, May I ask why? Were you in two different cities? Mm, I mean, we lived in two different cities, but it not, it's not like it's super far apart. I mean, I had my apartment where we met. He had his apartment when, 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 he, when we got together. Right. Um, part of it is because he, there was a, there's, he had family members that were living in his apartment as well. Uh, uh-huh. So that's what kind of you know, complicated uh, us being able to live in the same place. Um, so, there was, so there were other kind of family uh, obligations that, like I said, had already existed before I came into the picture um, that impacted that. So, so I think that because of some of those, uh, some of those, those factors and variables that were neither bad nor good, they just were um, just a part of life and a part of his life. Um, it just made it difficult for us to be able to actually build, a, to build anything really uh, to, together. So, you know, this whole thing about living together, not living together, when I was married, I was married for eight years. Uh, I think we lived together at least four or not, if not five. No, it had to have been five, five or six years we lived together. But we were in the entertainment industry. We were with the circus. That's how I met Clark Weigel on the circus. He joined one show maybe six years in. No, I joined the circus. I rejoined the circus. We were on the circus. We met. We left. We went to Sarasota, Florida. Then I rejoined. I forget why. Um, Maybe that wasn't the smartest idea. And then he rejoined another show a few years after that. And I remember at that time, this was in the 80s. I remember at that time, Woody Allen was seeing Mia Farrow, and they did not live together. Now, Mia had a ton of children from Andre Previn, and then she adopted on her own. So she had a lot of kids. Woody didn't have any kids, but they they lived across, I think, Central Park and could see each other's uh, window uh, from where they each were. And I said to my husband at the time, Hey, maybe that's really an interesting idea. <laughs> maybe people shouldn't really live together. Maybe we could live next door. So my whole solution was, well, we can live next door. And it would be like, um, we wouldn't get wet if it was raining out and we wanted to visit. Right. We would be right there. Or if we lived in two houses next door, we could build a little tunnel or a bridge. <laughs> so again, I was all, it was all about the hair and makeup. We wouldn't get uh, disheveled right. seeing one another. And isn't the honeymoon or isn't the courting period the best period ever when you're really not living together and you're doing your best to be the best you can be for each other? That's right. That's and I think right. living together messes it up sometimes. <laughs> this is up a good thing. I, I think it definitely can, but I also think that the reverse side of that is if you are, if you're not, okay, so if you are going to decide to live together, my thought is that now you have to be really more intentional about how you're building your relationship. So, okay, you decide to live in two separate spaces, that's fine, but how, how are you going to build trust? How are you deepening the, 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 the bonds that you have together? If you're not living in the same place, which means you just don't happen to show up on the couch at the same time, how are you building in that time to spend time with one another? Um, now the date night becomes essential because you're not living in the same house versus it may be a little bit more optional if you happen to fall into the couch at the same time. Um, so now everything becomes intentional about building a relationship if you're not physically in the same uh, space. Well said. Yes, I agree. I, I can totally understand that. I guess not living together is a bit of a cop out. Okay, so <laughs> then, <laughs> then um, you decided to file for divorce. Who decided? Who asked? It was, was it mutual? Was it you? 
Yeah, no, it was me. It was me. Um, and, uh, and, and he was, uh, not happy with that, with the decision. Really? Um, he's still not happy. <laughs> he's still not happy. This is because he really loves you. I don't know if it's all of that, but, <laughs> but I will say, um, I, I think that, I think that what he, what, what he probably, the reason why he was unhappy, I would think, and the reason why he's kind of still unhappy is I don't know if it's so much love, but I think it was because I think there was an awareness that he knew that because he was pulled in so many different directions, he wasn't really able to, we weren't really able to build anything together. And he wanted Um, the opportunity to at least try. I think, I think that's probably it. Yeah. Did he suggest an alternative lifestyle living situation where you could possibly build a relationship? No. Uh, wasn't you know, able to offer that. Not, not at the time. No, no. Okay. I, yeah, I don't. I don't think. I, I think that he was. There was just so many other things that he was trying to figure out, um, mm-hmm. and other pieces and parts of his puzzle that he that he was trying to put together. That I don't think he had the capacity at that time to brainstorm another option of how we could figure this thing out. What was the divorce like? Was it a little tougher than the first one, or? It was definitely different. Uh, the, the first one was the first one was tough because it was my first divorce, and like I said, coming from the the, the Christian perspective, uh, it was really uh, it, I struggled a lot with ambivalence. So, do I stay or do I go? Um, and and it took a lot for me to get to the the spot of saying, okay, yeah, no, you really do need to leave, and um, and you'll have to sort out your relationship with God in a different way uh, because this is this is a choice that you need to make. By the second time, the second marriage, I had already been through a divorce. And so I knew, give or take, what the, what the framework was or what to kind of expect. It wasn't totally brand new like the first time. Um, so in, for me, it was a very kind of an easy thing because I'd already done it before. Um, and, and I also knew that I had reached my point of, uh, of, of needing to exit. And I think for me on both sides, uh, the reason why I was able to walk away is because I knew that I literally tried everything. I left no stone unturned in trying to rectify or rebuild or reconcile the relationship or reconcile the marriage. And so since I had done everything in my power, I tried couples therapy. I was reading all the books. We were talking to mentors, blah, 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 and nothing was working. It would just became apparent that this was probably just not meant to be. So, um, <clears throat> so on that side, it was, it was okay. On the other side, it was also different because the first, like I said, the first uh, divorce was very simple. Uh, there was no emotional blowouts or anything like that. Uh, and then I never heard from the guy again. <laughs> um, and this uh, divorce was, was quite different. We had a, a few, you know, uh, drop down arguments um, along the way of the process of getting divorced. Um, there was some really difficult conversations um, that we had. Um, it was definitely a higher, more emotionally charged uh, experience um, the the second time. Then, what were the issues? What were the triggers? What was the difficult part? Um, I think that it, I think part of it was just for him. He didn't really want to let go, mm-hmm. um, and so that was just he. He just didn't want to let go. I, he didn't. I don't think he necessarily had a plan for how to stay, but he also didn't want to let go either. So, <laughs> so, and I was. By the point I had, by the time I get to the point of deciding that I'm I'm out, I've already processed through all of that and I'm ready to go. So and I'm okay with leaving. So he, for him, it was more of a surprise, and he was still reacting to everything versus right. where I had already worked through all of those emotions um, prior to saying that this is what I wanted to do. So you went through what we call the emotional divorce first. You went through it on your own, mm-hmm. and then you presented him with your decision. That's right. And and your need to move forward. While you were going through the emotional divorce, did he say to you, if you can remember any of this, that your behavior was a little different? You just don't seem the same. You know, you used to do this this way, but you're not really doing that this way. Did, Did that come up? I think so. I th- <laughs> actually, yeah, I never thought about that, but I actually, I do think so. Um, 
I, I think that it came out more as, because I was def- as I was going through the emotional divorce, and thank you for the words to be able to describe that, um, I, I was, uh, because I didn't want to get divorced again, because I already did it once before. So it wasn't like I was like excited, like, yeah, this is what we need to do. Yay. Um, I, I, I really did try to, to try to make things work. And so I feel like I was, I was more emotional uh, during that process than normal. So there were definitely some times where I like broke out crying about, you know, stuff that probably I would have normally cried, not normally cried about, but because I was kind of in this, 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 emotional roller coaster of what to do and and reaching my frustration point. So I definitely think that there was a few times where he said, you know, I, he felt like I was overreacting about something or um, he felt like I was taking things seriously or personally that weren't serious or personal. Um, definitely those those kind of, of conversations did happen, um, which <laughs> further, I think, exacerbated the the tumultuous swirly <laughs> the spiral down. Well, right. there's a book called The Good Karma Divorce, mm. and it's written by a former judge, Judge Michelle Lorenz. Well, I had read this book a few years ago, loved the book. I interviewed her earlier this year, and she wrote it because after being on the bench in Illinois, Chicago, I think, for 20 years and watching people fight. I mean, when you're going to court, you're fighting. I mean, you're really fighting if you're going to court. You need the judge. She just saw so much human carnage in front of her on a daily basis. She said, well, let me write this. Let me write, you know, what my thinking is as I'm looking at these people who are literally destroying each other's lives sometimes so unnecessarily, but our emotions get in the way and then we can't think. And then we, we do things that we're, we're sad about sometimes, but we just can't think. That's right. So she was wonderful. But one of the things she talked about, which is why I asked you just now, did your ex-husband say, you know, you're asking a little differently. I'm not used to you. She said, because in the uncoupling process, especially for the person who's come to that decision first, albeit on their own, for the person who's come to it first, the only way that they can work on their emotions and make themselves ready for that point of starting the divorce is to pull back. Mm -hmm. And it's a protective process to pull back. Mm -hmm. And it's natural. But the other person has no idea what's going on. And then people, are you having an affair? That that would be the first thing anybody right. thinks about. Wait a minute, you're acting different. You've got to be having an affair. And right. that's not, and if that's not the case, and and the case is, I'm just not, you know, I'm not happy in this relationship. I'm not really ready to talk about it yet. Right. I need to organize my feelings. I have to go through the emotional divorce, which is exactly what that is, living with this idea of not being married until the point when the words can come out of your mouth. That that's really, that's really deep. And I think that what, what also can further compound that experience of the, of the pulling back uh, is if, for example, my natural conflict style is avoider. So I don't like dealing with conflict or, or things like that. And I have a natural tendency to withdraw. I'm also a introvert. So it's even more of a reason to naturally withdraw. Um, and I, because of kind of my own kind of psychological, you know, and traumatic experiences and things like that, um, I, always, I already struggle with a fear of commitment if nothing goes wrong, if everything is perfect, I already still have a fear of commitment. So all of those factors, uh, I think, you know, kind of all collaborate together as I was going through the process of this emotional divorce that was, you know, having me back up just a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, and I think on some conscious level or even unconscious level, I was aware of that. And I tried to, to, to not do that or to, to be or feel more connected or to almost kind of like force more connection or pull for more connection. But then nothing came out. So <laughs> there was like 
okay, well, you know, what are we going to do? So it's, it's, it's definitely an experience. And then here's what happens on the other side. And I want people to know this who are listening because I'm sure it's happening to some people uh, uh, listening to this program. So what happens is the one person going through the emotional divorce first and getting themselves ready to have the hard talk, then they finally have it. They're ready to file. But you have to let the other person go through their emotional divorce so that, and there's no time frame, I mean, who knows how long this is going to take, so that when you actually start the filing for the legal divorce, you can not rip each other apart. Because that will happen. If right. one person's already got themselves emotionally positioned to release right. and the other person hasn't, now they're being confronted with paperwork and time frames. And if there's a lawyer involved and, right. oh my gosh, it's overwhelming. And of course they're going to react right. badly or right. emotionally. And, and, and it's hard to get anything done. You That's know, right. you're kicking and screaming to, to the courthouse or however you did it. That's right. But yeah. You have to give that person. Did you give him time? To wrap his it's head around. Not, <laughs> what kind of a question is that? Like, <laughs> absolutely not. Like, I was like, oh, well, you I, didn't know I, that then. I did not make it through life. <laughs> Other people catch up with whatever their process is. Like, oh my gosh. No, actually, though, I, 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 I'm glad to be learning this, even in the context of this conversation, because it kind of explains a lot. And, and I tend to, I, I, I process stuff quickly. I'm more probably self-aware than most people are. Um, and I'm also more uh, task-oriented or result-oriented. So I'm going to move forward with what I think that needs to happen uh, for, for both of us, right? Um, but I, I, I definitely cannot say in, in, in either divorce that I gave them the time and the space and the capacity to be able to grapple with their own emotional response uh, uh, to, to the divorce. I, I was, yeah, I was just kind of like, yeah, I'm done. Um, I wanna, I'm going to file the papers and, uh, and this is what we're doing. So in, in retrospect, um, that's definitely something that I, I, I would have, could have done differently. Um, now that I know, for sure. And now that you know, yes. if you ever want to just go back to either of them and say, with years gone by and with this brilliant woman in this podcast who I was talking to, right? Who like, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry, or I didn't, I didn't understand that you needed time like I needed time. And I bet that just puts a little cherry on top of the end. I, let me know if you decide to do that, because I don't know if you ever felt badly about it. if you did, and I don't want you to feel badly. I don't want to put emotion into you right. uh, or intention into you. I mean, this is your life that I'm now in charge of, but no, um, <laughs> this, this is your life. But you know, some people, we live with guilt sometimes though, yeah. that I wish we would have done it differently. Nothing beats a heartfelt apology. That's right. Or a, an apology and a recognition of, if I could do this over again, I would have given you your space to grieve, right. to process, because, you know, the courthouse isn't going anywhere. That's right. It, it's there. It'll accept our paperwork. So, you know, it's never too late. I love that. Okay, good. Good. Let's see. Now, we have another relationship on the horizon, though. So how long between, it's a third relationship, so we have the number three again. We have three. How long between the divorce and meeting the love of your life? Oh, um, it wasn't that long at all. Uh, so um, let's see, I think the, we, 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 we talked about the divorce in, in 2017 um, and it was kind of at that time that I had also connected with the person who was the love of my life. Uh, but we were kind of just knowing each other as, as friends. And so, uh, into 2018, um, is when we actually did the filing for the divorce and the divorce became finalized near the end of 2018 or like the last quarter of 2018. Um, and so my, my, my good friend and I, we call that, he calls that 
the, the, the time we were building a friendship together because I was technically uh, still married, even though I was getting divorced. So, um, so that, that's what that particular period of time is uh, for us. And how long have you known each other? Uh, it'll be, we're at three and a half years. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to force that out of you. I know you wanted me to say it. <laughs> well, but don't lie. If it's not, don't say the right number of years. You don't have to lie just to make this an interesting part of the, the discussion. But say why this relationship is different. Wow, uh, we don't have enough time, Judith. Um, <laughs> the relationship is different uh, because because he's secure in who he is, which allows uh, him me to be secure in who I am. And he doesn't. Ha- he's not. Uh, he he doesn't feel intimidated by me. I can't push him around. Uh, which is, and this is the relationship, but I think the, probably the best way that I could describe it is that this is the first relationship that I've ever been in where I realized, oh crap, you're actually not easy to be in a relationship with. But I've never had that aha moment for myself (laughs) until this relationship. All the other times I was like, they, if they would have just blah, 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 it would have worked this is the first relationship where it's like, oh, yeah, you have some tendencies that's not cool, girl. Like, <laughs> Interesting, know. a level of self-awareness you hadn't gotten to that yet. I had not gotten to yet. But the only reason why I got there was because of how much he, because of how he loves me, because of how he holds the container for me, because of how he's, how much, how hard he's worked on the relationship and on keeping us together and on us deepening and building it, that it became safe enough for me to be able to see, yeah, there's, there's some, <laughs> there, you're not quite as perfect as you think you are, or there's definitely some areas that, that, that you need to work on where he's really strong. And you're kind of, you know, struggling here. <laughs> so let's see how we can, how we can uh, balance this out more, more equitably. And I think all of the other relationships, I always felt like I was the one who was holding everything together. I was the one who was trying to force everything to happen. And in this situation, it, it's quite different. Um, and so it's, it's allowed me the space to be able to kind of grow and develop uh, in, in a different way. It's really nice. You, um, when you first met him, was it by any chance kind of a knowing of the soul? Did he seem familiar to you? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one of the first conversations that we had was, um, what are your dreams, right? Like, what, what do you want? Where, where do you want to be? Um, and it was like, I said my dream because he had asked me the question first. So I shared my dreams and then, um, oh no, I'm sorry. It was in verse. He shared his dreams and then it was like my dream. Like it was like, it was like exactly the same. Uh, it was quite oh. fascinating. Yeah. It was like, you know, uh, wanting to be able to own a business. I wanted to be able to teach at a university. Uh, just, uh, just, it, it was, it was interesting. And like wanting to be able to travel, uh, it, it was almost identical. And it was like, he took the words like right out of my mouth, but this was like the second conversation that we had ever had. It was like, wow. it was, it was very bizarre. It was very bizarre. Um, and, nice. Right. And so the, of course he was like, well, what are your dream? But I'm like, well, everything that you just said. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Did he different? So. Dang, that is really nice. That is really, really wonderful. I'm so happy for you. I really Thank am. You. Thank you. Yeah, eventually we get to where we need to be, I think. We do, we do. And, and I think um, we, it's never the path that we thought. It's, 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 it's just, it never is. Um, I, I didn't think that I would be married and divorced and married and divorced. Um, that was never my intention. Uh, and 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 even having been through the process, and even though I've learned and grown and developed in so many ways that I know that I would not have learned and grown and developed had my trajectory not went that way that it did, yeah. um, I still love love, and I still love marriage, and and it's still sacred to me. 
And I'm not the person that walks around saying you should get divorced, you know, oh, you got in a fight, get divorced. You know, it's like, no, like I like try to work it out, you know, talk to talk to people, communicate, things like that, try to get help. Um, but at the end of the day, if you've done that, you there you can't hold something together that the other person doesn't want to hold together as well. That's absolutely true. And and as I thinking back as you were talking that you did not grow up in a two-parent household. You know, obviously three years old is very young. So your norm was a one-parent household, yet you still wanted to be in a relationship. And you did, you were, and you you had your ups and downs and, and here you are in a different place. What I say to people before I give them the t-shirt that says it's never too soon to get divorced. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. That's, I thought people would crucify me if I ever started selling t-shirts. That oh, right? never, never too soon to get divorced. Sometimes it's never too soon to get divorced. Seriously. When you know you've made the worst mistake of your life, get out. You cannot reverse some situations. But I like that you said you still wouldn't have it any other way because what you learned about yourself in the first two marriages definitely influenced this new you in your third serious relationship. That's right. You are a relationship-oriented person. Not everybody is. That's I right. mean, we have friends and all of that, but we're not everybody wants to be, or maybe is even right, I don't know, um, for an intimate relationship. It takes right. a lot of work. That's right. And a lot of, you know, if I were to channel uh, Dr. Brene Brown, a lot of vulnerability That's right. to, to be in a relationship. And so you, you have to come prepared. That's right. You really do. So I'm so happy to hear you say all of that. I really, really am. I know we talked about your personal life and not your business life, but if people would like to get in touch with you either for, wait a second, in your coaching, you're, you're a certified, hold on, you're a certified business coach and a certified employee performance coach. What if somebody's going through divorce, is an employee at a company, and is struggling to go through the divorce and go through the business day all at the same time? Mm -hmm. Is this something that you would talk through as an employee, or is that really going over the line and it's way too personal? Uh, well, I think I think what you did, Judith. I think you actually combined two because I actually have two businesses. So I think what you just created was a combined service between both of them, which would actually be pretty cool. Would you like to do both? <laughs> I'll certify you. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. I would have never thought about that. So, um, so uh, on on yes, yeah, so on the nonprofit consulting side, I do uh, business and professional and employee coaching, but I also have a second brand, which is Layla Blooming, and that it's a separate DBA. And that is my, that's where I work with women in relationships, women who've been through very similar experiences like I have, um, who are coming through, who are overcoming something, right? And, and they want to be able to actually, uh, to be able to find a, a relationship or to be in a relationship or who are coming out of a divorce or considering divorce or some or things like that. So that's actually, it's a separate brand. However, it would be quite fascinating um, to... <laughs> to help that woman who is also struggling in the workplace. (laughs) You know, that's what I'm, that's, I told you, that's what I want to set off doing. I want to start going to corporations to be the divorce coach. Right. Not, not, not exactly what you do, the certified employee, but a divorce coach, because what I realize is, and we're going to give the website to Layla Blooming then in in a second. What I realize is I have a nine to nine to six day. I will email people that I'm mediating for or filing for in my business day, nine to six. That's right. They will respond to me quite often between nine and six. Now, are they working? Should they be working? Possibly. They don't do it on their lunch hours exclusively. Um, If they're having a not amicable divorce, an adversarial divorce, do you Mm -hmm. think there's maybe text messages and emails from the angry other spouse 
conceivably. And then who's picking up the kids? Honey, I can't. It's my day. Can you change your day and do that for me? You know, there's all of that going on. That's right. And so I was thinking, how do you do it? How do these people make it through their day? I mean, that's a lot to deal with. Hmm. Even if you don't have a job, right. all of that is a lot to deal with. Now you do have a job. So for those who would like to talk to you on a personal level, on a relationship level, Layla, L-A-Y-L-A, blooming, mm-hmm. as in a flower, blooming. That's right. Dot com, dot org. Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. Layla blooming dot com. Okay, so that, well, you, you are... Um, credentialed in a personal way to be talking and you've come out so far okay now is there a marriage set for lover the, our current gentleman or are you talking about that oh we're, we're actively talking about what well, it's it's going to be something that we're going to do both of us we're fractured from different religions but in both of our religions that is a very important uh uh, decision to make and a very important thing to do. Uh, so that is that conversation is taking place. Actually, uh, yesterday I was emailing him about some ideas that I had about, about wedding stuff. So uh, absolutely. Nice. Absolutely. Nice. nice. You have been an absolute delight, Dr. Lydia Evans, talking <laughs> to today. And the time has actually, the time's gone over an hour, which I rarely do. But it's been delightful, and I really want to thank you for joining us. I have, I've so enjoyed myself, Judith, and I've learned so much from just this conversation. Um, and so I, that, I appreciate that. There's one thing to kind of uh, interview people and get to share your story, but it's even better when you actually learn something new that you can take um, and use in the future as well. So thank you for sharing with me as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I really do. That's what we're here to do. Is, is is always teach and grow together. So thank you again, um, Lydia. I really appreciate it. And thank all of you for listening. As always, we grow as a community. If you know somebody about to embark upon a divorce, please give them our web address, theamicabledivorceexpert.com. If you would like to send comments or questions, topic at topic ideas for upcoming shows. I'm always here to listen. So thank you again, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. And as always, have an amicable day. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves, be kind to your spouse, and cherish your children above all else. 